be my love team. Hmm. Anyway. Well, I am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you think this is a new group? Do you think you could say something about the piano? Yes, I will. I would appreciate it. Yes. And we say which part is special. Amazing there have been so many done, peaks, kind of people done. coming over to me and saying what a revelation this revelation. is and all of that. And revelation, they're, they're like, you, you've touched, you are, you are. I don't know who you think the So Messiah I'll say that we'll be, back, we'll be back, we'll be back next, next year, year with another truth. Like yeah. Thank I'm not going to play. I just wanted to shut you up. <laughs> but I play very well. Um, and next year, when we're all back, the great troupe of pianists and myself, if Eleonora Leonard, I call her Eleonora, um, invites us, I will myself play a ditty or two. Yeah. But uh, I want to tell you that uh, this is a marvelous audience, and I'm honored to have you. And it's such a lovely uh, place. I mean, everyone is having a great time, all of the young pianists. And uh, it's so beautiful and airy, of course. But you know that very well. Tonight we have Chopin, the poet of the piano, and his music. Let us say that the world becomes so barren a place that we're all unhappy. Somehow, somewhere a piano will exist where someone will play something by Chopin and our hearts will be moved. For this man, this artist, will keep us from being zombies robots or whatever else and I myself cannot express enough to you uh, as a lover of Chopin as a pianist what he means to me and what he means to every pianist uh, this program is in memory of Arthur Rubinstein and Rubinstein and Chopin were forever linked together. And I thought that it would be wonderful to have his daughter come to one of these because she loves Chopin, she loves music. And then I said to her, knowing that she is an amateur pianist, in her, she says, the only thing about me is my pianistic name musically speaking, but you know I heard her play and I said, but Alina, this is a beautiful, beautiful Chopin impromptu. You are going to play it at the Hamptons Festival. And she fainted. <laughs> I took her to my own shrink. And she's come out of it all right. But we'll talk about that in a minute. But before we do, I want to say that Eleanor Leonard has put together something so important year in and year out with the extraordinary help that she does get and that everything that we can create of beauty such as this festival will indeed stem off the marginalization of the artist in our society and the terrible alienation that poets and dancers and sculptors and painters now have in a society that, as I've said many times, Gore Vidal put it best, yes, of course there's art, but there's no idea of art. And it's that that is the chilling thing. But we will survive, all of us. We will all continue to be lovers and to be great listeners. At the first of our programs, we talked about really the wonder of being a gifted listener and how, how you, in a sense, can become the composer when you just take that chatterbox and say, no more, I want to truly be attentive. 
Chopin's father, and I, oh, before we get on, I want to say that this piano has uh, served us well. This is our third night. It's come from New York to 11 West 58th, Clavier House. And it's a special instrument because the city of Hull in England was totally bombed and everything almost was destroyed, including the town hall where this piano was. And everything but this 1903 Steinway D was destroyed. This survived. And after the war, Solomon and Myra Hess and so many important artists played on it. And the most wonderful of them probably was Eleanor's grand uncle, Benno Moiseevich, who to me is, I call him the gentleman pianist, for he played with a suavity and an excellence and an elegance and a singing tone and a heart throb that made all of his colleagues love him dearly. And every pianist that even puts their hands on a piano that was played by one of the greats is important to them. A good example was at the Liszt Museum in Weimar, the great Paderewski, who also studied with Leszczycki, the same teacher as Moiseevich and Friedman and Horzhovsky. And he was shown Beethoven's piano, which had been given to Liszt. And there were lines of people to try the piano. And everyone did. They all, of course, and you know what they played. <laughs> but Paderewski is in line, and they said, Maestro, would you play on Beethoven's piano? And he said, no, I cannot. I am not worthy of it. And this is a special quality of mind that great pianists and especially performers have. The idea of tradition and of the sacredness of what was before. What I love about the world of the piano is that it is sacred. It is handed down literally by the human hand. Chopin was a piano teacher no different than Christopher Johnson or Jung Lin or Matthew Cameron for all pianists, even if they can afford not to, will always have some students because the need to give what they know is so important. And Chopin's career and his living was made from piano teaching. His father was born in Lorraine of France, 1771, so that puts him a year older than Beethoven. So as you see, Beethoven is the last of the Viennese classical composers, along with Schubert, and he dies in 1827. And just at that time, in the next three years, the great romantics of Schumann, Liszt, uh, Mendelssohn, and Chopin, all born within only 20 months of each other, come to maturity at the same time as the piano itself becomes a totally mature and perfected instrument. I can only use the term that Schiller used when he said, the gods never come down alone. And it was a great moment. His mother was born in 18, uh, 1782, uh, and Nicholas, the father, came to um, Warsaw because there was no living, making a living in, um, in his territory of Lorraine and he thought he would be able to teach French in uh, Warsaw and exactly that happened and uh, he took a position on the uh, family estate of the Scarbucks, a very important and wealthy land-owning Polish aristocrats. He also took part, which made him especially uh, Polish in his own mind. The wife, of course, was a pure Pole, but Nicholas being French. But he took part in the 1794 Polish insurrection against the Tsar uh, under General Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko was also, as you know, one of the important generals under George Washington, a great romantic freedom fighter. 
Uh, so by 1802, he was making a living uh, teaching the Skarbek's uh, children. And in 186, after a courtship of about four or five years, he married uh, Justina, a sensitive, quiet, unobtrusive woman who uh, Chopin loved. But Chopin loved dearly his parents, in, and without any affectation or any psychological problem. The father died in 1842 before Chopin, but the mother would live on long. And the first child, um, unfortunately, died at the age of 14. And she was a very talented young poetess. Then there was Louise, or Ludwika, who was um, the most special to Chopin. And she would come from Warsaw in the last weeks of his life. He had not seen her in 20 years. But his last wish was to see his sister, who he adored. So um, that takes us to his birth in 1810. There was a third daughter, Amelia. And to put the uh, historical perspective, 1814-15 is the Congress of Vienna, where Vienna is now the uh, capital of uh, Eastern Europe. And Chopin would live there in, the, uh, in his 19th year. But we're going to, and as I say, the 19th year. In Poland, he did something amazing. He had only had training with a man by the name of Zwini, a Czech violinist who also made Warsaw his home hardly knew anything about the piano, and that was Chopin's main piano teacher in life, a man who couldn't play the piano, a violinist. He loved him, nurtured him, and did something very special. He notated his first Polonaise. The first piece he ever wrote was the ceremonial dance of the kings of Poland, the Polonaise. And you'll hear that, of course, today, the heroic Polonaise, which is one of his great uh, martial works. And what he did was notate it. And more importantly, he said, and this was very rare at that time, I will nurture you on the preludes and fugues, the well-tempered clavier of Johann Sebastian Bach, who had literally disappeared after his death. So Chopin, in a young age, finds his ideal of genius in Bach, and then later Mozart. Chopin, as a personality, and it is apparent in every bar he writes, is one of the most fastidious, most exquisite talents of all time. Everything is perfection. And when people say, there is no perfection, I say, oh, yes, there is. Any Mozart work, any Chopin work, it is total perfection. He knows how to compose, and he knows what he wants to say, even if it's within a minute span. So this was what happened. By 1816, 17, he started revolutionizing on his own the piano's technique. And with Chopin comes the third, we can call it the third dimension of piano writing, because he teaches pianists new and novel forms of hand coordination never before heard. As a matter of fact, Matthew, if you don't mind in the F minor, come to the piano since you're going to play. These are products of his 19th year, one of the most um, prodigal and early developing of composers. He takes all that the pianists of the period write in the etudes, and he now not only poeticizes them, he makes them a hundred times more complex and more interesting. Before you play this, and they will never really know what's going to happen in the right hand, play some of the left hand until you're bored. <laughs> It's an extension that's very, very wide, and yet even a small hand can play it because with the pedal, he knows exactly how to make the euphony 
that he's after and the harmonic sounds. Listen to the change. It could be a piano piece on its own. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, he says, Sampra agitato, and whenever he's in F minor, he is a little agitated in one way or another. I want you to now listen just to the way he does his right hand, which is motivical, but how it will spread out through the piece. That's all. Now it spreads a bit. He repeats it. It's a little bit irritated, you notice? It's a little bit petulant, as well as poetic. Now, within two minutes, he takes this, he develops this exquisitely. He adds a beautiful little ending, a coda, which is like starlight, and Matthew plays it magnificently. Now, after that, he'll play two more etudes, as you see on the program, one being the famous revolutionary.
Last etude was composed um, when he was in Vienna and he had heard that the Polish uh, insurrection of 1830 was crushed so brutally. And he has a little diary at this time and he talks about, uh, in fact, he had never talked more hysterically in his life, for he was a very controlled man. But he was talking about the Moscovites invading uh, his parents' home and his sisters being raped, and he wants to come back and fight, and they're on the barricades, and they send letters, please, you will do much more for Poland. Remember, uh, patriotism was once a romantic concept. Today it's just totally dangerous. Um, <laughs> it was always dangerous, but not totally dangerous. And uh, there was a romantic um, conception of Poland from its uh, uh, being oppressed that went through the whole of the 19th century, Paris being the real symbol of uh, liberal uh, um, Europe and every, everyone that could afford to get to the liberal capital of Paris did, and indeed Chopin would, but he didn't know that quite yet. So we have him at 19, so to speak, revolutionizing the art of piano playing. How uh, genius uh, is explained, we have no explanation, but uh, there had been tentative aspects in each of the etudes, meaning a piece that uh, 
would have a specific technical reason. The, left, uh, the second one is an arpeggiation, but with a melody on top, a most amazing and novel new thing. Then comes the uh, third etude, which you heard, which is uh, a tremendous uh, left-hand figuration, a masterpiece of left-hand writing with about 14, 15 different types of figuration in it. And there's never been a pianist since 1830 that has not tried to play it. Um, but of course, Warsaw is a provincial capital compared to Vienna, uh, Munich, and uh, Paris. And he has to be sent away. So at his 20th year, he performs at the National Theater his F minor piano concerto. Earlier, eight months before, his E minor. And he procrastinates, I don't want to leave, I'll never leave, oh my God, what it will mean to, to die away from my beloved Poland, of which, of course, he does. And uh, he, um, he waits, and they keep saying, you've got to go out into the big world. Poland is not big enough. We, and of course, this is very tough, there's many young people today that are asked to do this from all over the world, from Japan, from France, from Russia, from Korea, from Taiwan. They come to Juilliard and they're baffled by a society so complex. And so was he when he entered Vienna. He had been coddled and taken care of in his prodigy years and uh, he was uh, always, his whole life, spoiled in many ways. But he finally gets it up. They give him some Polish soil to take with him. The stagecoach leaves, and indeed he will never see his parents again but one time. And you may ask, why would he not go back to visit? It's only 1,200 miles from Moscow to, uh, from uh, Warsaw to uh, uh, Paris when he was living there. But the fact is, is that remember these insurrections the Poles were always put down and until 1918 when another pianist by the name of Paderewski becomes the first premier of Poland. You do not have a free Poland since uh, 1620. Uh, so he was a Russian subject and if he had come back they may have given him very severe passport problems. So he, they said please don't come back because they knew that this could be ruinous. So he leaves and he goes to Vienna, and Vienna in 1829 has no Schubert, has no Beethoven, has no musical life that had made it famous, Haydn dead. And he said, what? All they care about is Johann Strauss waltzes. <laughs> and that wasn't even Johann Strauss Jr. That was the first Johann Strauss. And he said, I don't know, I don't know what to do here. He went to see Czerny, the great piano teacher, and he said, I like the man much more than his music. Uh, Chopin was a witty man, a magnificent um, mimic. They said he could have been a great actor. Uh, Bogage, the greatest actor of his age, said that nobody, nobody could ever be a better mimic than Chopin. So with the constant, constant ill health, he always had a strain of irony, mocking humor, uh, and uh, was uh, very funny at times. So there's eight months in uh, Vienna, and that's it. He says, I have to get out of here. Where do I go? Well, everyone is, and remember, in hindsight, we know that Paris is now being cluttered with romantics. Uh, the whole of the young uh, artistic world, poets, painters, sculptors, dancers, everything is taking place now in Paris and it is the most glittering capital of the world. Bellini comes from Sicily and Milan to write his operas. Rubini is the great uh, tenor. Uh, Rachel is the great tragedian at the uh, uh, um, Comédie Française. Uh, everyone is there. Berlioz is given up his medical practice to uh, live there. Franz Liszt has been there, uh, and it goes on and on for pages. Never has there been in one city anything like the greatness and the near greatness. Delacroix, I can go on in any art. Um, 
Taglioni and ballet dancing, all of them legends forever. Pianists, of course, galore, because the piano is now the domestic instrument par excellence. So he gets to Paris and he's very, very, uh, he's very interested. First of all, he's a prudish. He is not like the others, a liberal. He comes from a, uh, a concept where uh, monarchy is not bad. And he um, it also is intrigued, though, with getting rid of a lot of his repressions. And he can't believe what Paris is. It's, um, it's a new world. And he loves the idea that he can be anonymous. He can walk down the street. And uh, he sees nobody that knows him, even though, because he was famous in Warsaw already as a child prodigy. And he, he talks uh, in his letters to his parents. He said, there are signs on posters everywhere saying, beware of syphilis and other venereal disease. And beware of all the prostitutes. Beware of the mud. And he said, but with all of this is also an elegance, a style that I have not seen and that I like very much. And so Paris becomes his spiritual home. And what's more wonderful, after a few months of hardship, he becomes the darling of the Parisian Salon. And he is, in fact, he's very upset in the beginning. What am I to do? I have no money. Remember, this is a very, very poor boy. They can send him a little bit, but that's it. He's got to make his way. He's 20 years old. He's insecure with certain people like Kalkbrenner, the great uh, pianist of a generation before, and he's rather intimidated by the perfection of his style, and Kalkbrenner says, I want you to study with me. In other words, I would like to take this, this young eagle and you know, mold him my way. And Par uh, Polish uh, friends would say, don't dare go to him. He just want, he's just jealous of you already. And the truth is, of course, he did not need to study with anyone. The inventor of the etudes, it's quite ridiculous. So. He's now happy. He has his first apartment. He has two Polish roommates, one a doctor. Both of them die. And again, we must remember how many people died young from tuberculosis. And as he entered Paris, once again, we have to understand that his debut is uh, postponed until February of 1832. He's there now almost a year. Why is it postponed? There's a cholera epidemic so vast that it kills after his first week in Paris. 30,000 people in the first week alone. <laughs> and um, he sees corpses on the street. And uh, it was a terrible time. There were two major cholera epidemics during his 18 years in Paris, in the first year and in the last year, the year of the revolution itself. So it's all very exciting and very dangerous. And he postpones his. Uh, uh, debut and then he uh, when he gives it he is a sensation but still very little money coming in and the Rothschilds invites him to play at their uh, home and the great banker says I think that tonight things will change for you young man he plays and the poetry the amazing insinuation of his magnetic, restrained but magnetic personality wins the day. Within a week, every baroness, countess, marchesa, they are all desiring to study with the young Pole. So money is now going to come in. And he writes, he says to his parents, and he's always very, very modest. He's not, he's not a snob. He's just an aristocratic person. And he says, I don't know how it happened. I am every night seated next to ambassadors and finance ministers and artists at the most elegant dinners. And I have done nothing to make this happen. But you see, timing is everything, as they say. And 1830, the elite of um, a new world of uh, Money had started to enter Paris after the revolution of July 1830. And you did not have the monarchy anymore. You had Louis Philippe, the bourgeois king. And it was a very different 18 years until he was ousted by the revolution. So Chopin saw a mild kind of uh, monarchy, a, a despot monarchist throughout those 18 years, who, uh, who left the people alone and was not even called 
the king. He was the citizen king. So he's happy and he loves it there. As a matter of fact, there's a little, he's so popular there instantly, there's a little uh, piece of paper that uh, survives with his, again, his ir irony uh, written down and it says, no matter how much success you will have in the big world, our dear Chopin, no one will ever, ever love you more than we in Poland. And in pencil underneath, Chopin writes, that's what you think. <laughs> So he had a great uh, 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 stem of, um, now during these years, he invents, not the, the early inventor of the nocturne, it's an Irish and very sensitive and beautiful composer, John Field. But he takes these beautiful pieces with widely dispersed left hands and a singing sound which is based on his love of opera and he transforms the piano into the lyric instrument that it became and he writes the rest of his career 18, 19 gorgeous nocturnes some of the most languorous melodies and you'll hear in this F sharp major nocturne in six sharps the beautiful and exquisitely pinioned uh, melody which then becomes a passionately lyric middle section and Christopher Johnson has come all the way from Warsaw this morning. And I, I thought you were going to bring the Chopin piano, though. <laughs> he left it in Warsaw. And um, he's ready to do it.
So he's in Paris, he's happy, he's doing well, but he does not like to give concerts. One of the greatest pianists that ever lived, but he said, the audience's breath intimidates me. And he says, I'll leave this to my friend Franz Liszt, who was, then they had an amazing relationship. Now, 1830, 32, 33, 34, he goes, he goes by and he's constantly working. The, um, the man is producing the etudes and the uh, first ballad, the impromptus, uh, and it never stops. It's, these are very, very good years for the, uh, for productivity, the 1830s. And of course, these 1830s were stimulating years in Paris because he got to talk all the time with his great friend, the painter Delacroix, who called Chopin the truest artist I have ever known. And Schumann had been pouring out in his magazine in Germany inky rhapsodies to him, writing these wonderful, wonderful accolades that this is, you know, the great new composer, even though that at the same time, born in the same year, Schumann is writing some of the most immortal works of the piano literature, and they become friends. And in 1836, Chopin sees his parents in Carlsbad for the waters. Somehow everything worked and the parents were coordinated with uh, his trip to Paris and uh, to uh, uh, Germany and he saw them for the last time in his life, age 26. He had not seen them since he's 19. They had two good weeks together. He then went to Dresden where he is courting a young countess, Maria Wodzinska, a 16-year-old beauty that uh, he was charmed by. And uh, when he left, it was a year earlier that he had uh, met her. When he left, he uh, wrote, as a matter of fact, the Les Dear Waltz, this little waltz. Everyone knows this note was not published until it was hers. It was published later. But that didn't work out beca because, <laughs> because, let's face it, they liked the idea, Chopin was a famous prodigy, they liked the idea he represented Poland to the world, but they really, really didn't want a poor pianist in the family. <laughs> and that was the real reason. This was a huge huge land-owning uh, um, noble family. And they weaned them away and they kept saying, you know, there's reports of bad health and, you know, he's going to die soon and he's, he's, you know, he's not going to be a good husband and so forth. Well, he writes this piece, which of course immortalizes Maria, the farewell waltz, and um, he then goes on after this trip to see and this to me is wondrous. No fax machines, no telephones, no long distance call, no anything, no satellites, not incredible. He knocks on the door because he wants to pay his respects to his exact contemporary. They're both 26 years old. They're both of the immortals of all time. And they both ad admire each other, although Schumann admires Chopin far more. But Chopin wants to pay respects to guess who? Robert Schumann. And this, I want you to read this, I'm going to read this letter to you because it is so wonderful. He knocks on the door, afternoon of February, of uh, September 14th. He visited him, he left from Dresden to go to Leipzig just to see him. Knocks on the door, Schumann opens it up, and he's stunned. It's Chopin. They had never met, never corresponded. And Schumann is writing to his friend, the conductor, Heinrich Dorn, and he says this, Dear Heinrich, just as I received your letter two days ago and was on the point of answering it, who do you think walked in? <laughs> Chopin. <laughs> that was a splendid treat. We spent a wonderful day together, one in whose honor I took a day off yesterday. 
He gave me a new ballad in G minor. Imagine the world had never heard the G minor ballad. And here he is. He's coming in. He's giving him the manuscript. And he says, it seems to me his most inspired work. And I told him I liked it best of all his works. And after a long pause, what do you do when someone says, I like this the best? After a long pause for reflection, Chopin said, with great emphasis, I'm glad you think so. It is my favorite, too. <laughs> Besides that, he played a whole number of new etudes, nocturnes, mazurkas, everything incomparably. It fills you with emotion merely to see him sitting at the piano. You would love him. However, he gets this in in case the letter is published after his death. <laughs> However, Clara, who is his love, but he separated from because the father won't let her see him, is a greater virtuoso and plays his compositions with even more significance than he himself does. <laughs> Bull. But try to conceive of Chopin such perfection, a mastery which seems, and here is the great line, a mastery which seems unconscious of itself. And this was what people had repeated over and over when they heard him. It was as if it was ethereal, that it had nothing to do with an earthling playing an instrument. You're going to hear again this exquisite lyrical um, genius. Uh, and listen to the toying second subject. The first one spread out lyrically, but the second one comes along. And it's a beautiful example, not of a beautiful melody, but of Chopin's ironic sense. And then later on, it develops beautifully through different keys, especially into C sharp minor, into a beautiful coda. Yuko has come all the way from the planet Alcar. <laughs> and she is going to glide in this moment to play the A flat ballad.
that he was looking for perfection, every possible thing, and never on a manuscript would you ever find any possibility of knowing what any of the variants would be. He never wants anyone to know what the other possibilities are. Um, he was an amazing man, and he worked very hard as a piano teacher to keep in what he called, as he said to his parents, bon ton, good taste. He had to have the right carriage, he had to have the right uh, ballet, he had to have, and it cost a lot of money in Paris. Uh, he needed to have flowers, but he charged more since every aristocrat in the future. Just look at his dedications. Baroness so-and-so, this one, um, Countess so-and-so. It's a cavalcade of the, uh, the uh, Parisian um, uh, well-to-do and uh, their uh, uh, most important um, aristocrats. All these women studied with him, as well as some of the pianists who had higher aspirations to play concerts throughout Europe. So he was one of the first great piano teachers, and he would sometimes spend 10 hours a day doing it. And he gave to every student. The metronome was always there. Every student knew exactly what they had to do. He was a fastidious teacher and expected a great deal from many untalented students. Believe me, they wanted to study with him, and he needed the money. But no one would ever dare, ever, give him money by hand. It was absolutely understood that the 20 gold francs, which were an amazing amount of money, by the way, for the best seats at the Paris Opera were only 11 francs, would be put on the mantelpiece next to the fresh violets, for Chopin would never stoop to actually touching money. <laughs> so he made a mystique of this as well. This, um, this preciousness, this uh, a fastidious genius, and he was in contrast to the bohemianism developing after 1830, especially in Paris, the immense poverty of artists coming from all over the world, especially those that had been not happy with uh, the new Vienna under Metternich. Metternich was a despot who watched everyone. Schubert was even arrested one night. Beethoven indeed was arrested. Uh, so uh, they would flock there, and we will never hear their names. Poets and, and uh, of every art, uh, artist really dying for their art, because it was at that moment, we tried to blend in the historical aspects, that art for art's sake became something important, that the artist must not be fettered by uh, society, by uh, just patronage. They would die for their art. And indeed, they have been doing that ever since. Art for art's sake is a, um, is a concept that does not bring in the rent. Chopin, though, worked hard to keep in good taste. And in 1836, he meets uh, the woman that would be the most important women, woman of his life. He is surrounded by women at the uh, aristocratic uh, dinners he goes to every night. He loves them. He loves the petting. He loves the perfume. He loves the great food. And he will play his mazurkas and his newest waltzes. But he is not interested in a woman until he meets the most notorious one of all. This conservative monarchist meets this radical woman who is a feminist, who is an amazingly um, uh, well, just think of the idea in 1836, wearing pants and having a man's name as a writer, George Sand, and smoking hideous cigars. Chopin would faint near a cigar. It was so horrible. <laughs> Yet he tolerated everything with this uh, amazing woman. For let me say that some biographers treat her poorly. The more I have read about George Sand, and it's considerable, Every night of my life, I read about her. Um, <laughs> is, she is one of the most amazing women that ever lived. First, at a, he meets her at a soiree planned by, George, uh, by Franz Liszt and his uh, mistress, uh, the Countess Maria Dagou. And he looks at Liszt later on in the evening, and he's alone with him, and he says, is she really a woman? 
and Liz said, you'll see. <laughs> and uh, she planned on how to capture his heart. It took about six, seven months, but she did it. And when she did it, she became, without a doubt, a true muse to him, even though as an artist, she is a wonder worker, creating, well, just uh, the letters alone are 26 volumes in Paris. And um, the novels would stream out of her. She would work 12, 13 hours a day. She arose at 3 in the morning to write. And she was the most interesting woman around town. But he could not tell his parents about the notorious George Sand, who all Europe said, oh my god, George Sand, she'll destroy the world. Well, finally they take a little trip to Mallorca. But before that little trip, he is going to write his impromptu in A-flat. And this piece is a perfect example of the nonchalant lyricism of this master. Perfect in every way, with a middle section that is not Parisian as the other part is, but Slavic and beautifully poetic. Now, this is the part that's tough. Because hiding away here is the woman who, and I don't know how she did it, because if my father was Arthur Rubinstein, I would have fainted. <laughs> And she said she did. And she may do it again. And she may do it again. She's, she's a little, uh, she's, she's not believing that she's here. But I told her that I would drop her as a friend if she did not play in this. Because since it's dedicated to, show, uh, to Arthur Rubinstein, I said, well, I want you to play. And she really looked at me like I was half mad. But I can't play in front of people. Now, the fact is, is that she may not be able to. Please get ready, and if by any chance she stops, or wretches, <laughs> just applaud, because I'm going to make She's a great woman, and she has the burden of a genius as a father, but she's loved music all her life. And in the last years, she has, as she says in her way, attempted to play, but not in public. So in case there's any problem, I've told her that this is what's going to happen. She is going to get through this piece if we are going to be here till 3 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Are you comfortable? Don't ask. <laughs> Thank you. 
Charles Hockley first off. I said, look at those happy people. And she says, I'm happier than they are. <laughs> it's over. I want to tell you that this, this is incredible because I can tell you when the adrenaline goes, I mean, you're just without experience. Um, Alina, <laughs> would daddy be proud of you at all? He'd be proud that I actually walked over and sat there. <laughs> proud of you indeed. Great Thanks. job. So they meet, you know, and I want to read this. They go to Mallorca, which is a disaster. It's so, well, it's, you know, it was absolutely uh, not a tourist island in any way. And uh, it was so exotic and so beautiful. And George San wanted to go. Everything was great in the beginning, and he would write to his friend Fontana, who was almost like his servant, a Polish uh, friend. He would give Fontana directions, what wallpaper to put on, what hat to get from Duport, what slacks. I mean, it was an extraordinary friendship one way only. Um, and he's telling him about, uh, he says, don't give my landlord notice about my rooms. This is the Palma de Mallorca, 1838. I can't send you the manuscript of the preludes, which are all written at this uh, time at the island, or at least filed and polished. Uh, I have been as ill as a dog. After the first few weeks, they went to a monastery of Eldemosa, which is now a museum, and they, uh, he was sick, he was uh, um, weak, and the pulmonary... Uh, uh, disease had started to really, really spread in, in 1848, become the consumption uh, that would kill him in 10 years. But here is a marvelous example of his uh, um, humor, really. I caught a cold in spite of the 18 degrees of heat, the roses, the oranges, the palms, the figs, the pomegranates. And the three most celebrated doctors on the island have seen me. One sniffed at what I spat. The second doctor tapped where I spat from. And the third celebrated doctor sounded me and listened as I spat. The first said I was dead. The second that I am dying. And the third that I'm going to die. And the four months in this climate practically killed them. But the public hated the fact that he was coughing. And they were superstitious. And they see this woman with her two children from the previous marriage and uh, Chopin trudging up the, the hill to the uh, Valdemosa. And the weather got very bad. And uh, he's coughing and coughing. And they wanted him out of the island. They did not want consumption. They were terrified there of tuberculosis. So they treated them terribly. And there's a little book that you may want to get. It's translated. It's called A Winter in Nant by George Sand, describing in Gothic novel style they're four months there. They leave for Genoa, the only time Chopin is in um, Italy in his life, although he speaks Italian well. He's extremely educated. And he, they go back to Barcelona and then to Marseille, where the great tenor Rubino, uh, Rubini had um, killed himself. Everyone was doing suicide at that time. It was extremely romantic. And uh, Chopin played the organ, of actually some of the new preludes, the minor prelude and so forth. They went back to Paris and uh, lived next door to each other, dined with each other every night at the Square d'Orléans, which is a light, that was called the Little Athens. And uh, both of them were not allowed to actually have the same address, mostly for Chopin's parents. She couldn't give a damn. I mean, this woman was, you know, hardly uh, interested in the, uh, the good manners. Well, we're going to go back to one of the Chopin etudes, and Yuko is 
called, though she didn't know she was going to be called this second, but there she is. And she's coming down. I haven't seen Elizabeth Morgan today. I don't know if she's even come. I'm here. Elizabeth is going to show you the art of ornamentation through Chopin's Great Versus. And let me tell you, Chopin's gorgeous gift for radiant piano writing in the right hand and you can come. You can come down the aisle. An almost inexhaustible beauty where there's no... You're going to demonstrate. Come on. Go. This is an amazing tour de force because the whole of the what? 56 measures of the piece has one specific left hand. The whole idea of this cradle song is the ornamentation around this left hand figuration, which, does it change ever? Um, just at the end. Just at the end. Would you play the left hand? And I want you to memorize this, get your music paper out and notate it. That's it. It'll continue throughout. You won't even know it because the right hand's lavish and exquisite figuration. It's unanalyzable. It is so, it's, it's direct from some sort of God of the voice translated to the piano.
as I said, Chopin played very infrequently. And he had not given a recital since 1836. Outside of Poland, he only played his um, E minor piano concerto, one performance. Never again would he play a concerto uh, in public. It was in 1836 in uh, Rouen. And he hated it. And he would prepare by practicing the Bach preludes and fugues. And he would stay in his room for two weeks. And then he would emerge in the play show showrooms, which had a concert hall, uh, the important piano firm of the day, a piano he especially loved. And he uh, had flowers and all possible refinements surrounding him. And it was a major social event because he now knew everyone worth knowing, artistically and socially. We were speaking uh, of the dedications of Chopin. And it's very interesting what sometimes love does to you. But our next two works are very interesting because Constantine is going to play for us the nocturne, which has made such a sensation in the movie, The Pianist. And this nocturne is very interesting in the sense that it is the only occasion in Chopin's output that he uses themes from another work within the texture of the, the context of the work. And this is because his sister, and it's dedicated to Louisa, his sister loved the Chopin Concerto number two in F minor. So there are two themes from it. And she also cared very much for his little song, The Maiden's Wish. And this is disguised in this also. Then there's a little mazurka. And he did not name it Nocturne. He just named it a slow piece in grand expression. And always it has had success from the first time it was published, really, 50 years after his death. And um, it's now played in this uh, uh, movie. And I actually have a recording by Vladislav Spielmann playing this piece. And I thought, well, mm, maybe this guy is nothing. But this guy was something. It's beautiful. And it can be heard on Sony. But it will not be played on Sony better than it will be played here tonight. And then we're going to go to this B flat minor sonata first movement, this heated, death defying music drama, really. And it's one of the few pieces that has no dedication. Why? George Sahn and Chopin had a fight. And he dedicated it to nobody. And she wanted it so much. So today, in her honor, I'm going to dedicate <laughs> Chopin's Funeral March Sonata to Madame San. Here is Konstantin Sukovetsky.
we're going to hear a seldom played masterpiece, which um, is the second impromptu. Alina played number one. Of course, number four is the famous fantasy impromptu with the uh, middle section called, um, what is that pop song that Chopin wrote? <laughs> I'm always chasing rainbows. Whoever wrote this, if I could only find them, I would hang them like I hung <laughs> Mussolini. We're going to hear, though, the very unhackneyed second impromptu played by Matthew Cameron.
mathematical works of genius, always with exact point and always difficult in one way or another. John Lynn will play a small selection of them, and she is ready.